How we feel plays such a major part in our future. First, it's what we know so we can make wise decisions about danger and opportunity. But second is how we feel. First, it's how you feel about the past. You need a healthy attitude about the past so that you use it, not live in it, but use it. Not carry it like a burden, but let the wise lessons you learn from the past now serve as fuel to furnish the future. Next, a good attitude about the future. You got to set your goals. We look back for experience, but we look forward for inspiration. We must be instructed and inspired. No better inspiration than to set your goals. I started this process when I was 25. Literally rocked my world, changed my life. I had no idea it was so simple. Here's how simple it is. Decide what you want, write it all down. Make a list of the people you want to meet. Make a list of the books you want to read. Make a list of the classes you want to take. Make a list of the skills you want to learn. Make a list of the cities you want to visit. Make a list of the investments you want to have. Just make these lists. Here's the next key now. Start checking them off. Put a lot of little things on some list so you can start checking off something right away. That's part of the fun. Here's what's next. If you check off something major, celebrate. Because that inspires you to make a longer list of goals. And put everything on your list. Little things insignificant to someone else important to you. I put a little revenge on my first list. My mentor said it was healthy. Some of the people who said I couldn't succeed, kid from the farms of Idaho, they went on my list. Couldn't wait to get my new car, drive it up on their lawn. Say, oh, pardon me, here's the money to have it fixed. This little satisfaction. My Japanese friend, Toro Ikeda, San Jose, California, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. Way back then, everybody had a Japanese gardener. Everybody, Japanese gardener. Said, I'm Japanese, I'm going to have a Caucasian gardener. <laughs> okay, little satisfactions, right? Set your goals. Decide what you want. Write it down. Start checking them off. It's powerful stuff. Next, it's how you feel about everybody. If you want to be a leader, true leader, entrepreneur of the highest order, well-respected, unique in your field, here's number one, how you feel about everybody. And this is philosophical as well. You cannot succeed by yourself. So a unique sense of appreciation of everybody goes with the territory of leadership. It takes everybody for each of us to be successful. One person doesn't make an economy. One person doesn't make a symphony orchestra. It takes everybody. For this gathering today, all of you had to be here to make this gathering. Everybody. If one of you were missing, there wouldn't be this many people here. Everybody to make something work for the office, whatever. The enterprise takes everybody. The gift of America is everybody who came over the last two, three hundred years, bringing with them their gifts. No country has become such a depository of the gifts of the world like America has over the last two, three hundred years. People coming, bringing their gifts, gift of language, gift of learning, Gift of politics, gift of government, gift of medicine, gift of healing, gift of music, gift of the work ethic. All this came in steady streams from all over the world, making us unusual because of the gifts that were brought. And to understand that and appreciate it now gives you open access to the market that's available to make your fortune. Now, what I love to do is go back where these gifts came from. Not long ago, I was in Rome, had a thousand people in my class. Someone suggested, Jim Rohn loves the music of Andrea Bocelli, the blind opera singer from Italy. So when they introduced me, I walked to the podium and all 1,000 of these Italians stood up and sang for me one of Andrea Bocelli's songs. In true Italian style. Here's. I described it to my uh, grandchildren later. I said, here was the scene, a choir of a thousand and an audience of one. And that was me. I thought, here's where some of these gifts came from. The gift of poetry. The gifts. So learn to appreciate the gifts. Now, the last attitude is how you feel about yourself. Nothing more powerful than self-esteem, which creates self-confidence. 
The greatest steps towards success come from self-confidence. And that comes from self-esteem, doing what you know you should, so that at the end of the day, you have high, high self-esteem. If I could give the children of the world a box for Christmas for every day, I'd give them a giant box of self-esteem. And they'd open it up and see that it doesn't make any difference what you wear, who you are, what you've done, what you own, what you drive. It's how you feel about what you're doing at any given moment in time. Self-esteem is the deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth. And that's why, as the second winning attitude, it is the single most important quality, in my opinion. It's the internalization of value. Doesn't make any difference what you're doing. Doesn't make any difference what you did last week. Doesn't make any difference what you're going to do tomorrow, but it, it makes a difference of how you feel about your potential. It's that feeling. You know, I give programs for young people in the summertime, and they come to youth camps, and I've been trying to help young people understand that it's not designer jeans for tots, and it's not uh, what you're driving or what you're wearing, it's how you're feeling. That's why peer pressure is so strong. You want to belong to a winning team. They'll never be a human being more important than another based upon what you got or how you look or what you do. It's how you feel about yourself. And that's the most important thing, the internalization of value internal standard, not comparing yourself down or up with anyone, using competition to keep you honest, keep the quality in and the price right, and setting internal standards and giving your wins away. The three greatest fears that I've come in contact with in my life are the fear of rejection, which is the greatest fear that anyone ever has. It's greater than the fear of anything, the fear of being made a fool of in front of your peer group. Why do you suppose the pressure is on young people to dress, act, and look a certain way? It goes right up into adulthood. We're all the same. We're afraid to have people laugh at us. That's why in kindergarten, they raise their hands. They don't care if they're wrong or right. They just want to answer anything. By the time you get to the fourth grade, you begin to worry about people snickering at you and being wrong. By the time you're in high school, you say, I ain't answering. And when you're a grown-up, you always play it safe with the same kind of friends who have the same beliefs. and That's the way it is. The fear of rejection becomes the fear of change. I don't want to change and set an example. I might get criticized, I might get ridiculed, and it becomes the fear of success. And through all of my life, the one thing I've been afraid of most is making it, <laughs> of winning. You know why? Because where we grew up and how we were and how it was, it didn't seem right for us. And so I had permanent potential. I just kind of majored in minors and did things that were tension relieving instead of goal achieving and I made a lot of excuses, uh, the fear of rejection, I, there was always a reason. And success always stood in my way. They asked me to publish a book so I procrastinated. See procrastination is caused by the fear of success. You know if you did it you'd win and you'd be better. So I didn't do it so I could be my comfortable self. And it worked out right. I painted the fence and walked the dog next thing I knew the opportunity passed. It felt so good. <sighs> just to be me again. You and I aren't afraid to be rejected because we've learned one thing about self-esteem. Since self-esteem has nothing to do with performance, it has to do with potential. You and I can separate who we are from what we do. And the one thing you learn with high self-esteem in life is you never carry failure forward. Failure is always left where it belongs as a learning experience, a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block, a temporary inconvenience. I've decided the one way you can spot a winner or loser in the making is the way you project yourself, your value. You always project on the outside how you feel on the inside. I know I do. I, I can't hide it. I'm not the best looking in the group, but I'm always looking my best in the group. I can't always wear the finest clothes, but they're clean and pressed usually. And you always project on the outside how you feel on the inside. You can't deny it or can't get away from it. And so that's that's kind of the way it is. I can spot in me, other people, the ability to accept a compliment and the way you forecast your value to others. When people used to say nice things to me, I threw back all the value they gave me. It's an easy tip-off, rejection of value or acceptance of value. Pretty nice looking suit, Dennis, and I'd say, yeah, yeah I was going to give it to the goodwill, you're right. He said, uh, pretty nice tie. And I said, yeah, I got some mustard on it this afternoon. And I, he said, yeah, kind of sloppy eater. You're right. Uh, we brought you a present for your birthday. I said, you shouldn't have. You spent too much. They said, we know, just checking your value.
They said, thank you very much for what you did for our son. And I said, it was nothing. They said, hmm, we'll tell him that for you. We sure appreciate what you did the other day. And I said, don't mention it. And they didn't next time. They knew. Why would anyone, when you're paid a compliment, not accept it? Gee, your hair looks beautiful, I said to her. And she said, <laughs> have split ends, need to go to the beauty parlor. I said, because you got dark roots. She said, you got a big nose. I said, I knew that. I wore this really neat sweater one winter, and they said, oh, look at that. What is it, uh, alpaca, or is it? Uh, I said, it's got a moth hole right here. And they said, oh, gee, better use mothballs. I'm learning to look at people now and hold their gaze. I'm learning to give them my hand and my name and that it's okay. I'm learning to project value to people. I'm learning never to lead with an excuse. I don't make excuses walking in. I try to give people value and accept it in return. Self-esteem, the single most important quality, the feeling that you got no ceiling. As you now know, self-esteem means accepting yourself as you are right now, as a changing, growing, imperfect, but valuable individual. And since self-esteem is the foundation for all high-performance human achievement and happiness, it's absolutely essential that you take specific action to feel better about yourself. Here are my action steps for enhancing self-esteem. First, take stock of your personal assets. Ask yourself, what are my talents and strong personality traits? Who are the family members and friends I can really count on? What are my accomplishments and skills? What are my goals, my dreams for the future? What do I want to learn? Where do I want to go? And who do I really want to be? Make a list of these important answers and review it often. Next, monitor your daily self-talk. Avoid using negative prison words and replace them with positive, constructive words. Instead of saying, I can't, say, I can. Replace, I have to, with I choose to. I'll try, with I will, if only, with next time, impossible, with possible, and why me, with try me. And finally, communicate value to others. Greet people with a smile and a handshake. Give your name up front when meeting someone in person or on the telephone, and maintain good eye contact when speaking and listening to others. Always say thank you to compliments.